excellent panel here who will share with us their thoughts in terms of how do you build this muscle organizationally uh, to innovate. Uh, the panel uh, whom I'll shortly introduce, uh, you know, comes uh, with a variety of experiences. So we have people here who've done business model innovations, process innovations, and of course on the, on the product side, we have funders, we have social entrepreneurs, we have people from academia, and we have people from India and from all the way uh, from the US. I think it's a fairly eclectic panel, and you know, without further ado, I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, the details are all in the book, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, on my left at the extreme is Angeliki. Angeliki uh, is with the Tata MIT lab. Uh, welcome, Angeliki, to India. Uh, next is Naveen. Uh, you know, I don't want to take the, take the audacity of introducing him. Everyone knows Naveen. He's a host, uh, you know, and he's been a fantastic host. I've been here three times. Uh, you know, a lovely man, and of course, has a lot of uh, thoughts. My right is Kuldeep, uh, who works with Free Benefit. And the far right uh, corner is Sophie, uh, who works with Samantha. Uh, the way we're going to run the panel is uh, and myself, I'm Samantha Pandey, I'm a partner with uh, Gritspan in Mumbai. Talk targeted innovation through disruptive technologies. Because I think that's what um, MIT and, and our center is trying to do. And I want to give a few examples. First, I want to say um, that I'm only here because of the generosity of Mr. Tata and the Tata Trusts. Um, they founded the MIT Tata Center in 2012. And um, what we do is we have faculty from MIT that do projects that will have a huge impact in developing countries. So we choose projects that we think will have an impact that will be really significant. So sometimes we don't do a perfect job, so some of our projects don't work out as well as we think they might, but some of them are just amazing. So um, we funded a lot of students, and we work in six main areas, agriculture, energy, health, housing, environment, and water. And what we do is we work with our partners. We have many partners in India, and Naveen is one of our partners. Um, because we don't believe, and the whole, the whole premise of the MIT Tata Center is you don't just do research by yourself in a lab. Because that's what I did when I was a graduate student at MIT. You do research, and after your four or five years, you're like, well, what's going to happen to this work that I did? Is it ever going to go out in the real world? So what the, What's great and what I know all the Tata Fellows love about the MIT Tata Center is we don't just work in the lab. We come to India, we talk to people who have real problems, and then we try to work with them on how to find a solution. Um, so collaboration is the most important part. And the other thing that's really important is we, we don't care about solutions, any solution. It, doesn't have, it can't just be a solution. It has to be a solution that can be scaled. So for example, one of our projects is a urine-based tuberculosis test. And that has to be cheap enough that you can do it for less than a dollar. And so people don't have to leave their houses. They could just have this little test and stick it in a cup of urine, and then they know whether they have to eat or not. So we're trying to do things that will affect people in, in a really big way. Um, and I'm giving you a couple of examples. This is actually one of our most exciting projects. We have a rapid diagnostic test, it's a dipstick, where you can detect the three different types of dengue, chikungunya, and zika for less than a dollar. So that's, that's our model. If it, if it was going to cost, you know, a hundred dollars, it would be useless because we can't scale it up. So we need to try to find solutions that, from the very beginning, we think will work this way. Um, we have another, this is actually a new project about um, produ producing fertilizer, which is really exciting um, and it could work really well in India. Um, we've been working with Jaipur Foot for many years and we have a new design foot which costs about the same as the wooden foot that Jaipur Foot has been using, but it has an incredible performance and it's been tested and people can actually do all sorts of things that they can't do with a regular 
uh, wood and dry brick wood. So this is another example of innovation um, that can be scaled. Um, this is our solar powered irrigation pump. Um, solar powered village scale water desalination. We have another project where um, we made this um, braille labeler so that um, children or teachers uh, of the blind can make signs. They basically can make labels with just regular scotch tape. So it's something very cheap that can be used um, very easily to help uh, blind people. Um, here's a really exciting project where um, we're trying to recycle tires. And the way, I don't know if you know anything about tires, the reason tires are so tough is because they have sulfur-sulfur bonds, and that's called vulcanization. In order to recycle tires, you have to break those bonds effectively, because otherwise, if you make new tires with just plain cut-off rubber, it's going to fall apart. It's not going to have the strength. So you have to break the sulfur bonds, and then you have to make new ones. So we have a new project doing that. Um, and then the last project I'm giving an example of is Tour of Action, where we have a mobile unit that goes from village to village, and basically the farmers can put their um, agricultural waste and make char, which they can use to burn, or um, they can also make fertilizer for their for their fields. So I'm going to stop with that. Um, yeah. So thank you. The organization's ability is going to innovate to take failure because not everything is going to be successful. Uh, secondly, in the sector, affordability and scalability are important. Uh, what would you add to that? Maybe say a little bit about what you do also. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Kuldeep. I'm from an organization called Re Benefit. Uh, so very quickly, uh, we work with young people. Uh, we call them Sol Ninjas. And we solve ninjas, solve local environment and civic problems in their neighborhood. So uh, we do that through local data, local solutions, and the local community. Um, uh, so the whole idea is how do we get young people to start solving real issues, not at a project level, but at a real life level, at a neighborhood level. And we work with about 25,000 students, we have built about 100 solutions, we have about 1,000 data points, uh, wherein we are working in the region of I mean, uh, in our case, uh, the collaboration piece of it is extremely local. Uh, so when we are building a solution, uh, all we care about or all we understand is that the local solution, uh, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach, uh, even in a setup like Dynamo. Uh, so for us, the only mantra is how to constantly prototype the solution so that it can it can be plugged into different geographies in the same city with different sensibilities. So that's how we do it. I think that's a simple approach to how we are being done. Thanks, thanks, Kuldeep. And you know, again, rapid prototyping and solutions coming from within the community rather than the uh, Over to you, Sapnil, maybe you share again where you, know, you start the thoughts on Okay. Hi, my name is Sopnil. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, I run an organization called Savagra, which provides sanitation in the urban slums. And if you would have asked me the same question about six years ago, I would have a different answer. But I have very few hair left in my head and I am much more mature, I guess. So, we basically work with governments and uh, local leaders and politicians and communities in order to provide sustainable sanitation facilities. And what, what I want to say is that there is one line that I believe defines everything that we do. And that is what I call social norms. So what I always say is that in India, it's okay to kiss in open, not kiss in open. <laughs> and we are basically trying to change that. We are trying to bring people to toilets and you know, use the toilets, we are trying to government to be a part of this process, give us the land or toilets and we are trying to have local leaders be a part of this process. And what I have learned in the last seven years of running Samagra is that, that we have to be positively deviant. And what I mean by that is that we have to find out bright spots that, that work already 
and try to figure out a way to amplify those bright spots as Kuldeep said because answers are already there. We have to find them and maybe tweak them and that requires a lot of testing, experimentation on how to make it replicable and scalable. And we are still trying to figure out a lot of different aspects of our model but what has worked is that finding what works and then trying to figure out how to, how to make it big whether it is uh, getting a ribbon cutting ceremony from a local leader so that it, it becomes a part of our mission to basically engaging government for putting a new material in the tendering process or basically spending time with the users to figure out so for example we started digital banking and we realized that if we make it too easy for our users they, they actually become very uh, 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 you know scared about or oh, it is too easy to use, is it, is it trustworthy and all those things. So putting in extra barriers and all those things. So I think being positively deviant is what we have learned uh, in order to innovate. I mean, lastly, I mean, everyone knows about this funding foundation. What are your thoughts on innovation and how do you think When we started the sandbox, uh, basically, so our major mandate that how we can keep uh, promote or create a lot of social innovation in any geographical area, either be it Hubli uh, or Nizamabad, Nalgonda, UP, Banaras. So these geographies were, like when you ask me 11 years back, I was talking innovation. I said, okay, what do you mean by innovation? Whether this is innovation or that is innovation, and how you define it. But if you now, you, you see the whole discussion and discourse at least here or, or other part of the sandbox, people kind of more open and, and sharing each other idea, getting new understanding, building the thought process, and, and kind of getting open up. Because for creating a direct, uh, directly jump to the public, uh, uh, to create uh, innovation, first we need to build that culture. If that culture uh, uh, doesn't exist, sharing the idea, trying out, Failing fast, shorter feedback loop, taking those feedbacks more seriously, and then kind of uh, inventing the whole processes. So those are kind of very very important part of iteration. Whenever we, we do anything, and Sandbox started championing these kind of stuff. Uh, uh, so it has both elements: outward looking and inward looking. Both elements have to promote the innovative culture in the organization. So let me stay with you. So you said, you know, one is of course, you know, all the new processes, rapid prototyping, you know, failing fast and all that. But there's also the software and culture, you know, element to this culture, right? So as a leader of a social enterprise, what are the two or three things leaders should do to actually foster this culture of innovation? And what you have done, right? I mean, more, more importantly, what have you done? And what have the others done to actually foster that? When we, we are talking the culture, we are talking essentially a group which combines everyone in the organization. And, and they believe in a kind of idea where, where whatever their mission, anything, either it's a, a, a sanitation or health education, whatever be, uh, uh, doesn't matter. But they are always constantly figuring out how they can, whoever is their customer base, how they can make a more impact. And in that process, they have to always find a different way to do it. Uh, 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 and that's where we have seen that a lot of organizations who are, who are open for learning, open for expressing what is the problem they are facing it, they were getting better inputs and idea. And those are the people who think that, okay, that's the only way things can be done. They took the out there. And mentioned that every five years or three years, things are changing very rapidly. And, and, and if we are, uh, we, we don't know when we have stopped, uh, when we started talking, oh, we have done it 2010 days, 2009 days, 2011 days, okay, what is going on 17? So, you know, so, so, so you start living in a history uh, very soon. So how we can, we can have, we live in the 17 or maybe 2020 mm -hmm. and then keep iterating uh, uh, how, how to move forward. Otherwise, we are just history. Kuldeep, I think your challenge is even bigger, right? So as I understand your model, you work with you. So you don't have necessarily a fixed team. So when you're kind of developing a culture in most organizations, you're working largely within the boundaries of that organization, right? 
in your case, your organization itself is poor. So how do you, how do you actually build the culture? So actually, I think it's an advantage working with young people. Uh, they're less cynical. Uh, they, I would say, they really believe change can happen. And uh, they, are, they are not um, the, the dogma of frameworks and, uh, you know, analysis and all is not there with them. So therefore, I feel real change can happen. The only thing is we should make them an equal stakeholder and not start preaching. So what has worked for us is, I think, uh, one is, um, at least in our organization, we have not glorified innovation. Uh, you know, there is too much focus on being out of the box that people have forgotten how it's to be inside the box. So for us, uh, the first thing is, uh, the focus we do is, is just to listen. Um, and especially when you are working with young people, if you start putting your constraints on them, uh, your failures uh, onto them, then it doesn't work. Uh, the second thing is, uh, as an organization, there is too much focus on um, doing and thinking rather than just thinking, thinking and doing. Uh, sometimes I have seen that uh, uh, what happens is the most articulate person can convince whether the idea is good or bad. Uh, but for us, when we are working with young people, and I have seen this when we are working with government school children who don't know how to speak English, if you take the same problem and put it out there, they can actually solve the problem in more innovative ways than uh, talk about it. So that's been the second thing. Uh, and third, as an organization, for us, there's massive bias to action. Uh, we are saying, let us prototype, let us talk about it and work on that. So we have a fixed team uh, who are solving problems on a real-time basis. And the students, the community are actually sharing and collaborating much more uh, and at a much faster rate. So for us, just to summarize, like listen more, talk less, and like have bias to action. So we're just stuck to the simple uh, principles. That's how we have approached it. I'll take your advice, listen more, talk less, in what you want to add. So in my case, uh, the challenge was we work with a section of population, like uh, our, our staff consists of manual scavengers who have been exploited all their lives. And then there are women entrepreneurs from the community who are not adept in using technology. And what I, what I, in the beginning we made, we made these mistakes as Kuldeep was saying. So, we were very preachy that this is going to solve the problem using smartphone and WhatsApp and whatnot. And what I learned is all the principles that Kuldeep just mentioned is that actually many a times solution to these problems come from the staff which is facing them. So many a times actually listening to those uh, inputs from them in terms of uh, what are the different ways uh, you know the toilets can be cleaned or the you know community can be engaged or what are the different ways in which a local leader can be engaged. All those things when we start putting them into processes, they start solving our problems faster. So I think those are the things that have worked well. And this this is what we have incorporated into the culture in terms of having weekly, uh, quarterly, you know, six monthly reviews of all the things that have worked and sharing those practices. Thank you. And Kuldeep, thanks for kind of highlighting that, you know, it sometimes has to be in the box. I think a lot of us tend to romanticize innovation. And the other romantic thought of innovation is innovation is happening in garages. And some great companies have been built in garages. But a lot of innovation is coming from, you know, very, very large organizations because large organizations do have the benefit of resources. And we have both, you know, organizations on this panel that are large and small. So what's your view? Is size, uh, you know, a barrier to innovation or it kind of benefits innovation? And we, maybe Angelique, we can start with you. Um, I think, I think that size can, you can use size to your advantage, especially um, because you can use people from many different areas and talk to people who are in a completely, like in, for us, in a different field. So <clears throat> MIT is a really big place, but when you do your research and your work, you're doing it in your own personal lab. But one of the great things about the Tata Center is we have our students talking to everyone all the time about their projects, and their projects are constantly changing. So they change 
just by talking to other people that are also doing the same, um, who are doing different projects, but also when you come to India, many times our projects go through several changes. So the first time we come to India and we start talking to the users or somebody who might want this um, innovation, we figure out that we need to completely change the model. Um, and I think, therefore, the small scale, you know, talking to people one-on-one -on -one is really important. Um, but having resources, so if you have a question, hey, or if I need to try something else, can I use your lab to do it? That's a really great thing, too. So I, I guess I agree with the fact that you know, for, for us, resources are a constant struggle. You know, if, even if uh, we have a good idea, finding a funding for it, finding ways to scale it, it's always a constant challenge. Uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, resources are important and the reason, I guess, big companies uh, might not have been able to innovate is because they were not ready to go out into that un uncomfortable zone. And that's why, I guess, the small, nimble companies are able to innovate. But resources are important for innovation. This is, this is what I believe. Although you can build rapid prototypes in order to scale it up, in order to impact more people, we require lots of resources, which can be done in maybe partnership with the big organization. I'll straightly answer your question. <laughs> uh, uh, for big organizations, it's very hard to innovate. Because when they are steering the ship, you can just stop and take other direction, other, unless until you are uh, like MIT kind of place where research etc. is predominantly happening. And, and, and if you stop the ship, everything fall down. Whatever resource you pride up, it's evaporated in six months. So, so uh, it's just a very, very kind of calculated that in much, because suppose you have 500 people or X, Y, Z, automatically switch the gear is like a kind of, uh, and you have to face a lot of resistance also. So for, for smaller organizations where they have a idea or, or it's kind of fairly uh, uh, more uh, they're inclined to innovating a lot of new things. The moment it gets bigger and bigger, it's a tougher and tougher. And, and with less outside, more inside, they have to face <coughs> resistance. So, so we have seen a lot of organizations who were uh, smaller. They were quite fast. They were able to innovate and demonstrate feedback loop, etc., etc. But as uh, uh, colleague, my colleague said, the resource play a very, very important role. But in, in the social sector, when, when, where Kind of our innovation levels are slightly different than the, uh, I'm not talking the MIT data center kind of thing. Uh, she has already mentioned the number. Uh, 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 of course, you need a resource if you're doing that cutting edge and a lot of feedback. But a lot of people who are kind of working with the $2, $3, $4, $5 communities, their the realities are slightly different. But needless to say, you need a resource. And the more teams in Azari, more feedback is processed very quickly, the, the innovation uh, materialized better and better. Or it gets changed also. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I know the answer to this question, but I very quickly just give you an example. I, I don't know if it's a function of size mm -hmm. or if it's a function of thought process. Uh, so uh, as an organization, like last year, a student coined a mantra for a salt small and I give you this example. So we had had a hackathon about eight months back in one of the leading tech startups in Bangalore. And uh, we had called school students uh, and there were these like techies from the best colleges in the country. And the hackathon was to try to fix the pothole issue of Bangalore because uh, about 800, 900 people die because of potholes in Bangalore. And it's just tragic, like dying because of potholes. So the winner was a 16 year old boy who built a uh, 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 an algorithm where every single time your car or bike goes inside the pothole, uh, the phone automatically detects it and puts it on the you know server. And right now we have collected, we have data points from about 4,000 potholes in Bangalore, uh, and we are linking it with air quality and so on and so forth. So now my question, the I'm posing a question to your question: Is it the size, uh, what, what these techies had everything, or is it the mindset? And I'm increasingly believing that people with less barriers to prove actually end up innovating much faster than with people with lots of barriers. So 
I think size does matter, but more than that for me is the thought process which is far more important. <coughs> Great points and you know, I mean, in summary, there's really no right answer for this, right? I mean, you're right, it's, it's all about mindset. Even if you're large and you have the resources, how do you remain agile, nimble? And I think equally important, how do you, how open are you to failure? Because if you're doing innovation and you say, 70 to 80 percent of my projects are successful, then I kind of challenge the fact that you're doing innovation, right? So in, in larger organizations, the metrics and performance systems do tend to kind of sometimes focus on, you know, success and innovation is not about success, right? It's, it's also hugely about failure. Uh, the other thing which I think Naveen, you alluded to is, and which is also the topic of, uh, you know, not only the session, but development dialogues, is collaboration. So how can large organizations and, you know, uh, small organizations collaborate? And I just wanted to turn to the panel uh, more about examples either in your work or that you've seen where these kind of collaborations either uh, with the community or with the government or you know two organizations and Tata MIT is of course one of the examples where organizations have actually collaborated to, uh, collaborated to innovate. And Angeliki, maybe we can start with you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think I think that um, there's no question that the more um, collaborators you have, first of all. I don't know if any, any of you have know very much about network theory, but I mean, to really have an impact in, in the world, you need um, to have as many connections as possible. And so you, MIT is sort of like a hub, and I find that what makes it possible for us to be successful in what we do in India is all the collaborations we have. There's just no question about it. We're nothing without collaborators. So, um, and, and I think the, the other challenge is to work in a changing field because we can come to India in, in August and do something and by the time we come back in January, things have already changed. Um, so we have to be very agile in adapting and constantly modifying. So that's why I called my talk a targeted because we have a target, but the target is sometimes moving. And if you just sit there and think, okay, this is the target, and you work on it for five years, by the time you're done, it's not even there anymore. So we're, we feel like like the collaborators help us renegotiate where we're trying to go. Um, and and so I think that's a really important part. And you have, the more collaborators you have and the more honest you are with your collaborators, the more successful everything will be. All right. Uh, so I mean to say, I understand the concept of collaboration in theory, but in practice, uh, I found it difficult, uh, uh, at least uh, in the geography we are working with. Um, uh, I, I, again, I think for, for us, uh, the, I'll just give an example. So, when we started off, we were working in solid based uh, in Bangalore. Okay. I challenge you a little bit because you are, my understanding of your model is you're usually collaborating with the community, right? So. So, I, so this example will illustrate that. So we were uh, we tried to work with a lot of uh, not-for-profits in Bangalore, uh, working in waste management. And we found that process extremely difficult, uh, extremely difficult. It was almost like every not-for-profit there had a fiefdom of their own. And uh, for somebody who's trying to work in the space with, like this was my first job, genuinely, it was very, very difficult. So in a, in a way, we turned the model upside down. We said, let's collaborate with people where nobody wants to collaborate with them or say, ah, hai, bache hai. and we literally took that very, very seriously. Now today, all our solutions uh, we are working in, uh, we have these young people who are going. So we have the top companies in the city uh, collaborating with, with us when it comes to waste management or when it comes to sanitation or when it comes to local neighborhoods. So for us, uh, collaborations have happened more at a unit level of young people and that's how we have gone. Uh, but at an institutional level, uh, you, you, I, like I said, I, I just see that term in theory, that collaboration is good, but in practice, I have never seen a collaboration of equals happening uh, at an institutional level so far in my journey of finance. <coughs> exactly. Collaboration is collaboration. Meena meant that one. You are correct, 
Madam also meant they are talking. Any collaboration, the yeah, field, field the field field field. That's what she meant. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm giving my example. Yes. So, so I agree with Kuldeep. You know, the challenge that I found. So I have a software engineer by training. I was not supposed to be cleaning toilets. <laughs> and seven years ago when I started this work, people used to say, what have you done that we have not already done ourselves? The challenge is every NGO wants to be the first one to solve a problem. And every NGO comes to talk about sanitation, water or whatever, they will think that their model is the best. And I feel that that ego is, is the biggest challenge to collaboration. Because once we let go of that ego, everything actually starts falling into the place. So I think Kuldeep is a young, young guy, 25, 26 years old. Nice. So, so for, for when he started this work six years ago, maybe people will think, oh, you are a bacha, you know. What will you do that we have not already done? The same thing used to happen to me, although I was not a bacha uh, when I started. So I feel, uh, I feel the, that has been the biggest challenge for us. What has worked for us is actually going to big corporations and telling them that we, through the medium of toilets, are providing you access to community that you did not already have. So use us as a platform and they maybe sell your products. So you know, we collaborated with Patanjali and started selling Patanjali products to our women entrepreneurs. So that collaboration worked. So I think if, if there is a monitoring transaction or a win-win that a partner sees, then it works out well. Right. And clearly creating a win-win and also this whole mindset issue because ego is again a mindset issue. So Kuldeep of course is young but very wise man. Uh, so I'll ask the last question. Hopefully, it'll create some tension among the panelists. I'm taking a five o'clock flight, so I'm safe. Uh, to the you know to the social entrepreneurs, what's your expectation from fund funders like Naveen uh, to help you collaborate, and then Naveen will come to you. What's your expectation from social entrepreneurs uh, to help create and foster a culture of collaboration? And no words about <laughs> I feel uh, so. We so we are supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which which fortunately is actually uh, quite good on experimentation. So the challenge has been many of the funders that we go to, they don't believe in experimentation. Mm. They basically will not provide extra funding. I feel that has to change because a lot of if innovation has to be, because in India, I, I have a saying that, you know, the color of shit changes from one place to another. So if, if I have to innovate on sanitation from one city to another, I should be able to get some funding to do that experimentation. And for that is our ask for funders. That they, if they are talking about innovation, they better provide funds for innovation. <coughs> So, I, um, with Desh Pandey Foundation, uh, has been good, so I'm going to speak from a generic point of view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, I, go, I go back to uh, my old principle most funders uh, don't listen. You know, uh, I have very rarely sat in a funding conversation where I have sp spoken more than a funder. And for me, that in itself is a problem. You are not trying to listen to what we are trying to do, but you are trying to again start giving your theories, your schemas and your processes. And the second problem I have had with, and we have just started approaching funders aggressively in the last year, year and a half, is when you come up with a model, they, they ask you what is so disruptive about it. And then if you say it is too disruptive, they ask you to compare it with an existing model. So that's very, very confusing. <laughs> like, I, so for me, half of the time goes in trying to understand these jargons. If it's so disruptive, then sometimes you're not going to have a comparator. And you should be okay with it. Uh, uh, and if it is so okay, then you don't find it unique. So I, I, I sometimes I'm actually very, very um, confused uh, with uh, what they want. So now obviously with time, uh, I, I'm no longer a bacha, I hope. <laughs> so uh, with time what I do is I just listen to them. And if there is something in what they are saying which fits into our scheme of things, we go ahead. Or else, uh, no, but I, I mean to say, I'll just go back down to the basics, like just listen to people. And I think that's where the win-win will get created. But uh, you say disruption and things like this, it's very confusing most of the times. Even they don't know what they mean by disruption. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I guess for us, we're sort of behind um, in the sense that our technologies are now getting ready to get out there, and so we need funding to make them into products. Um, so it's it's a challenge because our technologists are not business makers, I mean, they're business students or MBAs or anything like that. So our big challenge now is finding partnerships between the technology and people who want to be social entrepreneurs. And in the US, social entrepreneurship is not as um, easy to promote, I guess, in a way for students or, or young people because they're there are not a lot of programs that teach it, and so people don't even know what it is. Um, the young people don't know what it is. Um, so we've been working actually now with the Chicago Booth School. Um, there's, the Tadas have um, started a program there for social entrepreneurship, and so we have two water projects that are working with their students, and we hope to have some startups that will be at, you know additional. We have one startup that's so sort of a social entrepreneurship, and we're working on trying to create more of those, but that is really a challenge for us, is what is the definition? How do you make a social entrepreneurship that's sustainable? We don't want an NGO, we want something that can make enough money to keep it going, and we want the product to be cheap enough that people can afford it, and it can really make a difference, so that is a really big challenge. I mean, your chance <laughs> to get back. There is nothing to get there. But I am saying, um, the fundamental question is, uh, for whom you are innovating? If you are innovating for funders, please don't innovate. <laughs> Simple thing, because uh, 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 innovation, as, as we are saying, it should be your inherent thought, or culture, or whatever we say, that if MIT would have been innovative for donors, God knows what they would have been innovating, uh, uh, and their interest level, etc., etc. So innovation is, is per se is, is a totally different thought process, and, and it's a continuous process. It's not that someone write a check and automatically you have switched on the innovation button. Look at the non-profit. Have you seen the Infosys and Wipro has applied same work somewhere? Never happened. Though they are big large company, have a lot of resources, they compete for all, all uh, little uh, project, etc., etc. So collaboration, you need a lot of trust. And the both party should have a win-win kind of thing. Anywhere, checkbox, two by two matrix. If win and lose, it never happens. Lose, lose, it will never happen. I think if you're innovating, all the funders don't innovate is, is a great mantra. Uh, we'll open it to questions from the audience. Please keep it pithy and please don't use the questions to test your business model or idea. <laughs> Uh, just being upfront so that everyone gets a chance, and we then need to give it, you know, hear closing remarks from Fanindra. So, our society is very limited. What uh, the earth can afford is a very small contribution to the world, and the need is very huge. For example, if you look at uh, three, what you just now spoke, the society's main points on one side, the mindset on the other one side, the scaling up on the other side with the commercial value and innovation on the other, it will never match. All three will never match. Unless there is a commercial value, the, the prototype reminds with the desk itself, with the lab itself, it will never go to the field. And affordability is a big question. I will give two examples of that. I am from the disability world. Uh, cochlear implant, it costs about 6 lakh rupees for any, any child to get operated before 6, uh, when he or she is able to hear. It's a simple, affordable, already existing technology, which can be made affordable to millions of deaf children, and we can eradicate that in the future. Nobody wants to buy it. Numbers are very small. Similarly, visually impaired, they use jars to read the screen we use on a site. So, a jar costs about 50,000 from US or UK. So, nobody wants to invest money on it. I think the DF should look at uh, how such you know, neglected areas where definitely players can really pitch in and uh, reduce the large one, make it affordable, number one. Number two, you could can bring you out best practices. I, I don't want to give a chance. Just two, two sentences. The other uh, area where you can do the best practices so that the government and the big players can, you can draw their attention and they will invest further. 
So that the influence the government is advocacy so that they will put their money in Thank you. Seven years is that actually there is no need to define social entrepreneurship differently. If a business or an organization does not make money or is not, not sustainable, it's not going to create a huge impact. So I feel the only different social entrepreneurs have is that they focus more on, on you know, the, the externalities or the, you know, the change that they are trying to make. But at, at the end of the day, if an organization, an impact organization does not make money or is sustainable, it is going to die. It is not going to create the impact that we are trying to see. So in my mind, it's all the same. Entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship. It should not be treated differently. There's one last question. Are you there that let, let people respond to this question? Because it's a very pertinent okay. question. Okay. So maybe the panelists will respond. I think the director said, but the, what? Uh, so is everyone to respond to that question? Yeah, that so, uh, that would be interesting. Like in social entrepreneurship, we kind of box it very badly. So here I would like to get out of the box. <laughs> Because we try to make social entrepreneur as a paper use kind of model, which is good for one kind of thing. But in Sandbox, we have demonstrated that, like Akshay Patra, the, the end customer or end beneficiary can never pay for it. But if you say that last five years, if 10 organizations have a scale in social enterprise, they may be one of them. So you can, you can also scale without paper use model. You can have broad-based charity or you can have mix of paper use broad-based charity. But the, if, as much as you are looking for the academic thought process of the social entrepreneurship, but the more important thing that whoever group of people are, are, are doing that, it has some social impact or social value. And, and that's how we characterize the social entrepreneurship. Without boxing, they should be like this or that, etc., etc. Because when we see in India, probably we will through for uh, uh, three fourths of the world, the tons of different kind of problems, and every year new kind of problems are emerging. So, so uh, 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 creating those social value and social impact play a huge role, and compassion, of course, is the poor source already uh, from morning, uh, 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 play a huge role in defining those uh, characters. There has been a lot of talk about education, and you know, you see Asar and you see Guardian, 100 of millions of children in school, they are not learning. Naveen keeps on talking about things out of the box. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> and we talk about, but at the end of the question that we still ask is, are our children learning alphabets? When you measure the success of something else, we want something else. Now how do you call that paradox? Means as a people who have been working, you have been working in the development sector, people are asking something else, they want you to do something else. And then they measure your success on, now your children still don't know alphabet, but you want them to be problem solver and creative. So, so it becomes very difficult. So I'll request Kuldeep to respond and then we hand it to Anindra because I think he has closing remarks and uh, I'm sure it'll be a lot of wisdom coming from him. Or at least we can listen to all the questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we can skip. <laughs> no, I think we can skip. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll very quickly try to answer uh, that question and uh, my only learning has been that uh, if we want, uh, if we want people of a certain strata to do good in education, we cannot slot them and say that they should only have good learning outcomes. Uh, I think we are, we are chasing the. According to me, uh, we are chasing the wrong thing again and again. Uh, I think there is a lot of potential here, uh, and. Uh, for example, in our case, we have been uh, approached by a lot of funders to change our model and include learning outcomes as a, a part of our program. But we have stayed away from that. Uh, my belief is that if we expose young people to real life issues, then it could be anything, uh, then there is true, there's truly a disruption in education there. Uh, uh, and if that's, for example, if you get a young boy or a girl to actually work on the sanitation issue in their own government school, then you're really talking about disruptive education. Unfortunately, the space right now doesn't allow for that. But I think that is the opportunity to be far more creative when we go there and we actually see. Um, so our data shows that problem solving skills or character skills are much higher in students in government schools than in private schools. The only thing lacking is communication skills. And I, I personally feel that's the huge opportunity in education when we can approach 
uh, these people with real life issues and get them to uh, solve. And just one quick point, uh, my mentor had told me this and so I'm just sharing it with you. He said, uh, uh, there's no difference between an enterprise and a social enterprise. There's a difference between a mission-driven organization and a non-mission-driven organization. So as long as you're a mission-driven organization, it really does not matter whether you're for-profit or not. I'm sure all of us have our uh, takeaways from the panel. Uh, I want to talk about my takeaway. Uh, like Samutra mentioned, I joined the government, government of Telangana. And uh, I'm the chief innovation officer there. Uh, I'm the first, I mean this role is first of its kind. Uh, no government has it. And uh, I'm the first chief innovation of, uh, officer of the government that has it. Right? And that shows on as to what Naveen was saying. Right? I mean, uh, about 10 years ago, there was no word of innovation. Uh, right? I mean, today, governments are creating new roles, uh, all of them are thinking there is entrepreneurship, for profit, not for profit. I mean, uh, that, that is an indicator that uh, innovation uh, is in everybody's mind. Right? Uh, and sitting there, I, was, I mean, because I newly joined the government, uh, my job is to nurture and encourage and uh, make innovation, uh, uh, make successful impact uh, uh, in the society. Right? And I have to work with a large population in a large geography. Um, and ever since I took this thing, uh, I was wondering what, I mean, where do I start? How do I end? Uh, it is very unlike uh, my other visit. I mean, uh, the Red Bus where you have to create a website and you know what exactly needs to be done. You have a product manager and a tech manager and etc. and all that. This is completely, completely different. So for me, uh, the takeaway uh, from this panel is, uh, uh, I mean, in the last one month that I spent in the government, uh, I went and asked my boss, an IAS officer, a bureaucrat, saying, where do I start, what do I do? Right? He said, call these big four consultants and ask them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then I did reach out to them because I was looking for solutions. And uh, I, I just said, okay, what, uh, uh, what are your ideas, right? And then they said, I mean, it is crazy. They, they, they themselves have not done, uh, I mean, at least the people that I went haven't worked in that. And uh, it is hugely expensive and they just, I mean, they're learning at our expense, right? And he said, this model probably doesn't work. And then I was uh, thinking, what else, right? Uh, then the solution is obviously, okay, set up your own team and then go and try doing several things, I mean, starting from hackathon to policy to several other things and etc. But uh, my, I mean, there the problem is, I mean, I've also looked, uh, in the one month that I had, I looked at other uh, departments and what they're doing and etc. The problem with me setting up a team and then doing it is there is only one way, there is no competition, right? It's very unlike uh, my startup, right? I mean, every day when we do something, every day we think of a solution, we fear that is it the best solution, because if the competitor does a better solution, we lose out, right? But that fear is not there in the government, right? I mean, you are the sole policy maker. There's nobody else who can, who can, who can make a policy. There's no competition. There is no test whether it's the right policy, but it impacts everybody, right? So I was, I was, I mean, I had that as a solution, set your team and then try to do things, but I was not convinced. And I landed up here, uh, I mean, like why I was, Okay, I mean, hearing these perspectives, I mean, one of the ideas that uh, uh, that occurred to me is, okay, why not work with uh, the social impact organizations who want to work on innovation, right? I mean, there are several of us, I mean, well, of course, uh, not here, but uh, okay, we have two people working on sanitation here, right? Likewise, if there are other uh, not-for-profit or other social organizations who want to impact innovation, who want to make this innovation happen, right? I mean, who want to... Uh, encourage uh, innovation and etc. Why not get them together and then give the government's resources to them uh, and then kind of set a competition between them so that the best ideas emerge and then uh, hopefully uh, it impacts uh, the society the right way. But but uh, that's kind of my takeaway from this. I'm sure all of you have uh, uh, very good takeaways from this. And uh, thank you, thank you, Samantha. Thank you.